Good morning and welcome to the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience Psychiatry Grand Rounds. My name is Walter Dunn. I am an assistant professor at UCLA and the Greater Los Angeles VA. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Stephen R. Martyr, the Daniel X. Friedman Professor of Psychiatry at UCLA. I think most of you in the audience would agree if I say Steve is our mentor and friend. Over his career, he has trained countless clinicians and researchers, imparting his wisdom and knowledge with kindness, humanity, and generosity. Steve has been at the forefront of psychosis research for the past 40 years on the national and international stage, contributing seminal work that has significantly advanced our understanding of psychotic illnesses and developed treatments that have made meaningful improvements in the lives of our patients. Dr. Martyr began his medical training at the State University of New York and completed his psychiatry residency at the University of Southern California. He then spent two years at the NIH before arriving at UCLA and the West Los Angeles VA in 1977. He has held numerous leadership positions, including his current role as the director of the VA Vision 22 Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center, and he's also the vice chair of education in the UCLA Department of Psychiatry. Early in his career, he recognized the importance of illness domains, such as negative symptoms and cognitive impairments in patients with schizophrenia. He, along with Michael Green, led the NIMH Matrix Initiative, which established the critical foundations for developing medications to treat cognitive functioning in schizophrenia. Numerous awards have been bestowed, recognizing his leadership and accomplishments in the field. To name a few, he is a recipient of the Lieber Prize for Schizophrenia Research from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and he has received the American Psychiatric Associ Association Award for Psychiatry Research. While he has enough achievements and awards for several careers, Steve remains an active investigator, educator, and clinician. I have had the privilege of working with Steve since my residency, and what has impressed me the most is his humility and dedication to patients, where he remains active in direct patient clinical care. He often talks about his favorite part of the week, which is Friday mornings, where he sees patients as the director of the UCLA Psychosis Clinic. Today, Steve will speak to us about new approaches to pharmacotherapy for psychosis. Okay, Walter, thanks so much for that uh, introduction. Um, it's really a, a pleasure to do grand rounds, you know, at this particular time, because I believe that there are going to be substantial changes in the way that we treat uh, psychotic illnesses, particularly schizophrenia with drugs. And I want to tell you about that and to sort of talk about this new approach, because I think for many of us, it's going to require some sort of retraining and uh, reorientation. So I think uh, disclosures are probably particularly important for this talk, uh, because I'm gonna be talking about uh, new drugs and particularly, I'm going to be talking about uh, drugs coming from a company called Karuna, Synovian, Beringer, where I've uh, served as a consultant. Uh, it's important to know that although I've consulted on uh, these drugs, I don't do uh, talks for, for companies. Um, so if, if that gives you a little bit of a perspective as, as I go through the talk. This is sort of my view of what the landmarks have been in the pharmacological management of schizophrenia. It starts with the uh, discovery of uh, chlorpromazine in Paris in 1954. That was a change that um, quickly penetrated throughout the world and really changed the nature of how schizophrenia was treated. Uh, rather than treatment being based in large hospitals, uh, over the years it's become dispersed and uh, treatment you know, more often occurs in communities. I probably first observed the effects of antipsychotics on schizophrenia when I was uh, a, a medical student, probably around uh, 1969 or 1970. And 
I thought that one of the most um, really persuasive uh, things that I saw was the idea that a drug could actually change how people think and what they say. To me, that seemed uh, almost unbelievable. Uh, over the years, I began to realize all of the limitation of these drugs and the people who went untreated. In 1990, um, clozapine was actually introduced, and I believe I was the first person uh, in Southern California, as far as I know, who actually treated a patient with clozapine. Uh, it was here, we're at uh, what used to be the NPI inpatient unit, perhaps on this very floor where I'm uh, sitting. And I think that some of the people who uh, I've trained are tired of my talking about how moved I was by the experience of the first clozapine patient. This is an individual where I still manage her clozapine. And because of the introduction of this drug, she's had a, a really fulfilling and, and productive life. And she's actually just retired. It's a, uh, one, one of the most moving parts of my career was the introduction of a new drug. I believe that uh, we're poised hopefully for that to happen again, because there are going to be, within the next couple of years, the introduction of uh, the first non-dopaminergic uh, antipsychotics, drugs that don't block D2 receptors, which has been the way that all of our antipsychotic drugs have worked. So I'm gonna talk in some detail about two mechanisms that many of you are probably not familiar with. I'm going to talk about M1 and M4 agonists, and I'm going to talk about TAR1 agonists. Before I do that, I'm going to briefly mention drugs which are actually available. Uh, I'm going to talk about lumetepiron, olanzapine, and then uh, dexmedetomidine. Uh, I'm gonna then move on to talk about cognition and negative symptoms about co-medications for treating those uh, syndromes within schizophrenia. And then I'm going to talk a bit about how our team at UCLA is sort of involved and in sort of moving this area forward. Um, so these are the two recently introduced antipsychotics. Both of them don't work by a new mechanism. Uh, Lumetepiron is a, a 5-HT2A D2 antagonist because it has greater separation uh, between its serotonergic and dopaminergic effects. It has relatively little EPS. It doesn't cause a lot of weight gain, doesn't increase prolactin. Um, I think most of us have not seen this drug as being breakthrough uh, when we actually introduce it to patients. It probably has a role, but I think most of us are confused about what that'll be. Olanzapine samadorfan is a uh, combination drug. Uh, it includes olanzapine and samadorfine, an opiate antagonist, which actually uh, attenuates the uh, weight gain associated with uh, Olanzapine. Um, again, it's probably an, an, an effective drug. Um, it doesn't cause weight loss, but it just seems to lead to less weight gain. A more interesting new compound, and I don't know if it's been used here at UCLA, is a sublingual dexmedetomidine. Uh, this is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist which is indicated for agitation associated with schizophrenia. It's available as these uh, sublingual strips. It uh, seems to me like it may have a place in uh, emergency rooms and on inpatient units for individuals with agitation as a replacement for uh, intramuscular injections, which many patients resist and uh, can lead to kind of uh, probably unnecessary stress on both staff and uh, patients. Uh, since it's an alpha-adrenergic agonist, 
people should be observed for hypotension and sedation. And this is from uh, the, the study of, of, of the drug. Uh, you could see within 20 minutes of administering it, you get a significant separation on a scale that measures agitation. And you could see that people continue to become uh, calmer over the next 120 minutes uh, if patients are uh, still remain agitated, uh, they can get another strip or you can actually cut the strip in half and give them a smaller dose. Uh, so anyway, it seems like it probably has a role on uh, iron tension units. So now to what I think is the more interesting uh, portion, and that's the issue of uh, non-D2 antipsychotics. And the first I'm going to talk about are, are two are is a muscarinic uh, drug. Again, for most of us, showing this slide again, our dilemma has been that we the only antipsychotics that are effective are potent D2 antagonists. So I, th I think the art of treating schizophrenia has been dealing with the side effects of these drugs, dealing with uh, extra pyramidal side effects, discomfort. And the fact that if you did a popularity contest of drugs in psychiatry, I believe that the antipsychotics would come out near the bottom. People don't feel better usually when they take an antipsychotic. Eventually, they, they improve. But the side effects, which also include weight gain and other things, can be uh, tormenting and can really have profound effects on an individual's ability to adjust. So. The fact that we have new drugs that don't antagonize D2 receptors that treat psychosis by an entirely new mechanism, to me is incredibly exciting. I, um, when clozapine was approved, I uh, thought that it would uh, really treat a large number of patients. In fact, the uh, penetration of clozapine is, to me, shockingly low. Uh, in the clinic where uh, Walter and I work, uh, the psychosis clinic, we uh, it's the most used antipsychotic. Probably 35 to 40 percent of our patients are on it. But if you look around the country, it's far less. When the other new antipsychotics were introduced. Uh, our group, uh, then we were located entirely at the VA, were involved in uh, the initial trials of risperidone, olanzapine, quetiapine, aripiprazole. Uh, we thought, we hoped that these drugs were going to be like clozapine, but better tolerated. That didn't turn out to be true, that these drugs were more similar to the older antipsychotics with perhaps better side effect profiles. At that time, I predicted that there would be a huge change in the treatment of schizophrenia. I was wrong. So you should keep that in mind when I talk about my predictions about these newer drugs. So moving on to this, these two new mechanisms, um, I'll start with the muscarinic agonists and why they are, uh, have potential as antipsychotics. In 1957, there was the first report that a cholinergic drug could be effective in preclinical models of psychosis. Uh, there were a, a number of observations, including uh, in um, East Asian countries, uh, beetle nuts, which have high concentrations of arecoline, which is a muscarinic agonist. They were noted to uh, actually decrease the severity of positive and negative symptoms in schizophrenia. In 1997, zinomaline was being developed by uh, Eli Lilly as a drug for Alzheimer's. Uh, it did have positive effects in improving cognitive symptoms, uh, but it was also noticed that it had uh, antipsychotic effects in Alzheimer's patients that had psychotic symptoms. The development of zinomaline for Alzheimer's was stopped because of the um, adverse uh, responses, which were predictable by its uh, by being muscarinic. 
Um, now, xenomoline is a, uh, an M1, M4 agonist. It's a full agonist. Uh, this uh, shows you where the um, M1 and M4 uh, receptors are located. Uh, you could see that they're in key brain areas, uh, including the uh, cortex, putamen, nucleus accumbens, uh, areas that uh, are a target in schizophrenia, uh, and that they're less um, present uh, peripherally. Now, I our group was very interested in uh, xenomaline uh, because it had it see it could be a drug that could be added to an antipsychotic to improve um, cognition, and we had great difficulty get it, getting access to it. Now, understanding how an M4 M1 agonist uh, would affect schizo would affect psychosis uh, is something I want to talk about for a moment. This uh, this figure shows a um, uh, M4 uh, receptors on, on, on cholinergic afferents. They decrease uh, levels of acetylcholine, and they decrease the excitability of dopamine neurons. This is both um, in the ventral segmental area and uh, nucleus accumbens. So in other words, the effects of uh, M4 uh, agonism is uh, a modulation and a decrease in the excitability of uh, dopamine neurons, presumably the mechanism of action. Uh, and this shows, uh, this looks more at uh, M1 receptors. Uh, and here we're looking at the frontal cortex at layer two, three, at a, a GABA interneuron with uh, where M1 agonism actually uh, decreases the uh, excitability of pyramidal neurons, which has downstream effects on, on dopamine neurons. So in other words, these antipsychotic, these drugs, these agonists don't block um, the receptors themselves, but they decrease the excitability of the dopamine neurons. So these observations uh, led uh, a few years ago to uh, administering these drugs to people with schizophrenia. And this was done in a study at the University of uh, Indianapolis and um, University of Indiana in Indianapolis. And if you look at the upper left, blue is uh, anomaline versus placebo, you'll see that the drug uh, decreased uh, the severity of psychosis using the brief psychiatric rating scale. But look at the adverse effects. This was a study which had uh, a sample size of 10 people in each group. And if you look at uh, nausea, seven out of 10 people were nauseated, six out of 10 were uh, vomited, and seven out of 10 had some kind of gastrointestinal uh, distress. This is obviously not going to be a drug that uh, is going to ever get to market. We were very interested in studying it years ago, and for years, uh, people were trying to persuade Eli Lilly to continue to develop this drug, but to find some way to attenuate its uh, peripheral effects, uh, its peripheral GI effects. Eventually, another country, Karuna, uh, combined um, xenomaline with a um, peripheral anticholinergic, uh, a peripheral muscarinic antagonist, Trospium. And uh, this led to a, a study which was uh, reported in the, in the New England Journal, which found a um, really, as you could see on this slide, a substantial effect of uh, xenomaline trospia as an antipsychotic. It improved positive symptoms, total PANS. If you look at the lower left, this looks at uh, PANS negative symptoms using the factors that uh, I actually developed and, and promoted. 
uh, response rate with the xenomaline trospium were very high. Um, as you could see, well over 50% of patients had a substantial improvement. Um, that was a phase two study. Uh, last fall, uh, the results of the phase three study came out, and I should tell you that this has not been published. I've uh, looked at, I've been able to look at the data, but again, it hasn't gone through peer review. But this was their phase three trial. It was a five week randomized comparison of xenomaline trospium, which I'll call XT, uh, in uh, individuals with acute schizophrenia. And what you see is a, uh, again, the same uh, improvement. This is looking at total PAN score. And this is a, uh, an effect size of uh, better than 0 0.6, which is really uh, quite respectable. For, uh, most antipsychotic trials have led recently have led to drug approvals with effect sizes of something like 0.4 or less. So the, the, this suggests that the study was both well done and uh, the drug was effective. This looks at positive symptoms. The, uh, this is looking at negative symptoms. And again, you see that the effects tail off on uh, placebo, but people are continuing to get better on, on week five. And again, the uh, improvement rates uh, for this is looking at 30% improvement. You could see that they're substantial. Now, looking at side effects, and here the drug is called CAR-XT. If you look at uh, nausea and vomiting, which was 70% uh, uh, on uh, xenomaline alone, here it goes down to uh, uh, you know 19% for nausea, 14% for uh, uh, for for vomiting, which is not great. But uh, apparently the people were. Patients seem to develop a tolerance to those side effects. Now, when drugs sometimes enter clinical care, these side effects actually look much worse. So I, I think this is going to be a major concern about the drug. It's important to note that there was almost no uh, extra pyramidal side effects, no acathesia. Uh, it doesn't elevate prolactin. It doesn't show any of the effects that we'd expect from a D2 blocker. Now, I hate to show you a press release from uh, a drug company in, uh, uh, in an academic talk, but this is from yesterday. Uh, that was the first phase three trial. This was uh, a second phase three trial, which also found a positive result and an effect size greater than 0 0.6. And uh, the expectation is that uh, Karuna, the company, is going to submit a um, to, end, to, to the FDA in uh, the middle of this year with a launch uh, sometime uh, about a little over a year from now. So XT will uh, probably be available in our clinics sometime in, in 2024 as the first um, non-dopamine antipsychotic. Now, moving on to the second mechanism, which is uh, the trace amines. Um, trace amines are things that uh, many of us are just beginning to learn about. These are uh, endogenous chemical messengers. They are uh, the first receptor the TAR, the TAR1 receptor, and the one that seems to be most relevant. The psychosis was actually discovered in 2001. Um, it's been identified, TAR1 receptors have been located in limbic areas, basal ganglia, and prefrontal cortex. And uh, in rodents, when uh, TAR1 agonists block the hyperactivity from cocaine and amphetamine. That's a model which is predictive of effectiveness as antipsychotics. Uh, 
they also attenuate the response to uh, NMDA antagonists like ketamine and PCP. And they reduce the firing in, in VTA dopamine neurons. So they actually have a mechanism which is not that different from uh, xenomaline trospium, that they sort of uh, don't block dopamine receptors, but they sort of attenuate the firing of, of dopamine neurons. This uh, shows you a picture of uh, some uh, of these trace amines. Uh, they resemble monoamine neurotransmitters, but they're uh, expressed in very low concentrations, a hundredfold lower than neurotransmitters. And rather than being um, synaptic uh, neurotransmitters, they uh, actually uh, are intracellular, and uh, which is shown, shown in this cartoon. And uh, the effect shows that they modulate dopamine tone, as I've suggested. They regulate the glutamate circuits, circuits, and they modulate 5-HT activity. Uh, and again, this suggests that they could have roles as antipsychotic. And this was shown in, again, a paper from the New England Journal of uh, Psychiatry. At that time, the drug was called, uh, had a number. Uh, but you could see that there was a very good effect size. Again, the effect size was in the 0.6 or greater range for uh, total PANS, suggesting that uh, it's a vigorous antipsychotic. Um, this looks, the, the drugs has since gotten a name, you load her on, and you could see that uh, the effect size for negative symptoms is uh, 0.37. Uh, uh, looking at uh, the PANS negative, if you look at the BNSS, which is a better negative symptom scale, uh, you could see that it has substantial effects. And you'll notice that uh, patients that negative symptoms seem to be declining even after the study was stopped at uh, four weeks. Now, this is a phase two trial. Uh, there's a large phase three trial that's ongoing. Um, many of us have been disappointed as drugs go from phase two to phase three. But Given the, the large effect size on total PANS, it would be very surprising if the uh, phase three trial didn't report out positive, and this could report out in the next couple of months. Um, what's particularly shocking about this drug is the very low prevalence of side effects. Um, it doesn't cause weight gain. It uh, doesn't elevate prolactin, it actually lowers it, probably because patients were on antipsychotics previously. Um, and, you know, there's no evidence of EPS. This is from uh, an extension uh, of that study. And you could see in the first four weeks, there's the double blind phase. And then all of the patients go on, uh, again, this TAR1 agonist. And you could see that it, uh, the patients seem to stay on the drug and do relatively well. And then if you look at the side effects in this long term, patients actually don't gain weight. They have a slight weight loss. They don't have any changes in their hemoglobin A1C. Their prolactin goes down. It's, um, it's really almost creepy, the lack of side effects of, of a drug which seems to be uh, very effective. Um, you know, it almost, for those of us who always expected that if a drug is really going to be effective, it has to have bad side effects. You just wonder what's lurking beneath that for this drug, hopefully very little. Um, I want to move from antipsychotics to looking at co-medications for cognition and negative symptoms. And this has been a uh, very a kind of a central focus of our research group, the one that uh, Michael Green and I lead. Um, 
it's been shown that uh, the functional outcomes in individuals with schizophrenia are really determined by a number of factors, including their cognition, memory, attention, um, uh, processing speed, their motivation, which is usually from negative symptoms, the kind of apathy common in schizophrenia, and social cognition, the ability of patients to kind of read social signals. All of these domains have been an interest of our group, and I'll, I'll show it a little bit later, because improving these domains, uh, we believe, will uh, really improve functioning, uh, even in patients who continue to have some positive symptoms. There have been few positive signals. This is from uh, a non, it's from pemavanserin, which is an antipsychotic, which is not effective in schizophrenia, at least in a, in a trial by the company, but uh, is used in people with Parkinson's. But this was added to an antipsychotic, and you could see that there was a, a statistically significant advantage for improving negative symptoms uh, over the course of 26 weeks. You'll also notice that the effect is not very large. Uh, it's a relatively modest uh, effect. Uh, but there are other drugs that have, have been studied, uh, and uh, one of them is particularly interesting. It's a GLI-T1 inhibitor. Uh, GLI-T1 is the, uh, it's, it's a glycine inhibitor. Uh, the use of these drugs is based on the idea that reduced signaling at NMDA glutamate receptors is associated with cognitive impairment and negative symptoms. For NMDA receptors to function properly, they need glycine as a coagonist. Uh, what the GLI-T1 inhibitors do is they uh, increase the extracellular levels of glycine by inhibiting its transporter and therefore improve uh, NMDA functioning. And uh, a drug that's, uh, again, in a large phase three trial uh, is a, um, a drug called icloperton. It's, um, this looks, the phase two results looking at CIAS as cognitive impairment associated with schizophrenia. And uh, the phase two results, uh, if you look at the higher doses, you could see at week 12 that patients had improvement on the MCCB. I should mention that uh, our UCLA group has been at the center of research in this area. Uh, the, the cognitive battery that's used for all of these uh, trials uh, was uh, based on a uh, large NIMH um, collaboration that I ran along with Michael Green and the development of the MCCB had substantial participation by uh, Keith Nectarline and uh, others. Uh, also, the negative symptom measures that have been used in some of these studies were also developed by our group at uh, UCLA. Again, we've been at the forefront of this area. This looks again at uh, the upper two panels. Uh, on the left, it's a um, it's the predicted uh, dose response, and you could see that uh, again there, there's a, a strong suggestion that at the higher doses that uh, this drug will be effective for negative symptoms. Again, we're waiting for the um, phase three results. There are other interesting drug developments that are uh, ongoing. One of them is for uh, Ramiterant, which is a, um, it's a TAR1 agonist, but it acts differently than the um, uh, Eulodorant that I showed you before. As opposed to being a full agonist, it's a partial agonist. Uh, the initial studies in, uh, as an antipsychotic uh, did not show effectiveness, but it's still in trials for uh, negative symptoms. 
uh, there's a Merck compound, which would be added to an antipsychotic for psychosis. It's a uh, PDE10A, that's a ph phosphodiesterase inhibitor, uh, a 10A, which seems to show promise in early trials. There's another antipsychotic, uh, which is non-dopaminergic, um, but it hasn't met all of its um, endpoints in all of the trials. Uh, it's been studied mostly in patients who have schizophrenia and um, substantial negative symptoms. And in that population, it uh, may be effective. Avenamide is a, um, an, a, another new mechanism. It would be an add-on for treatment refractory patients, which has shown some effectiveness. It, uh, it seems to modulate glutamate and it's uh, involved in bo voltage-gated sodium channel blockade. Uh, again, that's about to initiate a uh, relatively large trial, and, and, and it seems relatively promising. Now, I want to move on to our group uh, and sort of what we're doing here at UCLA. Um, you could see our group is rather large. Uh, we're, we're very proud of the group. Uh, we've been funded by uh, both uh, our um, MIREC, uh, with the, that, that I direct, that's a VA center, as well as uh, Michael Green's uh, Center for Enhancing Community Integration for Recently Homeless Veterans. Uh, we are supported by NIMH, uh, foundation funding, and um, uh, the Brain and Behavior Re Research Institute. And we, uh, I showed this slide a, a few years ago, and I commented that uh, these are two buildings. One of them is uh, seen better days and is slowly deteriorating, and the other is Building 210 at the VA. Uh, since then, the rate of deterioration of Building 2A is substantially greater. And our research group, which has actually resided in this building for nearly 50 years, is going to be moved to an adjacent building over at the VA. But again, we have laboratories both uh, at the VA and uh, here on the second floor of uh, the, the Sebel Institute where I'm sitting now. This is uh, our studies encompass both psychosocial treatments as well as pharmacology. Uh, but again, you'll see the focus is on these domains that are related to functioning, like motivation and negative symptoms, uh, cognition and uh, social cognition. Uh, this is a, a study which uh, just uh, was posted on the American Journal of psychiatry website. It was a study of a, uh, a psychosocial intervention that includes motivational uh, interviewing and uh, cognitive behavior therapy with uh, Felice Reddy and Shirley Glynn. If you look at the figure, you could see, and this is looking at uh, particularly at motivation, uh, you can see that using a scale, the Keynes, which is actually developed uh, partly by our group, uh, you could see that there's substantial advantage over a control group in improving uh, you know, motivational negative symptoms. Uh, Amy Jimenez from our group is uh, developing uh, uh, remote interventions, uh, things that could be done on a smartphone that could be combined with both uh, in-person as well as re remote activity. And it's being tried now in uh, individuals with psychosis who've recently experienced homelessness. And then again, that's kind of a, a focus of uh, Michael Green's uh, center here at the VA. Um, Anya Brashad is very interested in uh, 
so, and sort of the social deficits in schizophrenia and the kind of lack of social motivation that uh, seems to torment uh, people who are trying to rehabilitate individuals with schizophrenia. This is from her work at the University of Chicago before she came here to UCLA and she's uh, in the process of completing her psychiatry residency here. Uh, you can see from those studies, uh, MDMA uh, increased the uh, gazes at, um, at, at happy faces and decreased it at fearful faces, again, suggesting that uh, this, that MDMA, as it's been observed, uh, increases social motivation and positive emotions. Uh, she's initiating studies to see whether uh, MDMA might be both safe and useful as a drug for uh, helping people regain their sort of motivation for social activity. Uh, she's also studying um, buprenorphine, which is a partial mu agonist and a, a kappa antagonist, uh, which seems to also uh, be um, sort of uh, increased so social motivation. It, uh, this is from a study showing that it uh, reduces uh, subjective ratings of threat. And again, she's been funded by a NARSAD for a study which should begin in the next couple of months to see if this could be reproduced. In Chicago, she worked with uh, non-patient populations to see whether or not this could be uh, helpful in, in, this, in people with schizophrenia. Uh, John Wynn has been a wonderful creative partner in uh, looking at technology. We're uh, looking at uh, biomarkers to show how drugs operate in the brain. I've been involved for several years with uh, studies of oxytocin to see whether administering uh, intranasal oxytocin can facilitate um, learning uh, higher order social skills like um, empathy. Uh, and uh, John was instrumental in uh, helping us in the development of mu suppression, which is an EEG measure of social processing, which you could see helped us find the uh, most effective dose of oxytocin. He's also involved some very interesting studies of looking at neuroplasticity, that is being able to look at uh, long-term potentiation uh, as a clinical trial measure and, and another interest of our group. Um, Eric Rivas is a very creative scientist who's also been looking at uh, biomarkers of uh, social functioning. This would occur, this would be a functional MRI-based uh, biomarker uh, and, and the data would come while patients are actually uh, observing uh, films of uh, people. And uh, this, uh, we hope, will be related to a, a social functioning index. Again, these are biomarkers which we see as having great potential in uh, trials of uh, psychosocial and pharmacological interventions which would be targeting uh, the, the problems in social processing that uh, in schizophrenia. Um, Yvonne Yang has, uh, is doing some very creative work looking at uh, both uh, brain inflammation and oxidative stress. She has a very uh, innovative uh, way of looking at um, microglia activation with a, a PET ligand and uh, also looking at oxidative stress, uh, looking at um, MRS scans of glutathione. That's an ongoing a complex study. That's part of a VA career development award. And she and uh, Derek Novacek uh, are collaborating on, on a cousin center study uh, that will examine the relationship between uh, brain inflammation 
again, measured by that very interesting um, measure of a pet measure of microglial activation and comparing it to experiences of, of discrimination that'll be reported using a, a discrimination index. Again, the idea is that um, uh, the experiences of, of discrimination uh, can actually have a signature in uh, brain inflammation. Uh, uh, we're involved in other studies that I don't have time to mention or refer to. We're, we've done studies with, uh, Yvonne has completed studies of acetyl, of N-acetylcysteine in schizophrenia. We're looking at drugs that reduce oxidative stress including uh, ashwagandha and uh, luteolin. Um, I'm continuing the studies of uh, oxytocin combined with social cognition training. That study is, uh, we've published before and I presented it here. We're completing a large NIMH trial in the next couple of months. We'll be looking at the data. We continue to look at uh, cognitive remediation, and uh, Walter Dunn, you know, his continuous studies of uh, neuromodulation, particularly with uh, direct current stimulation. So finally, uh, again, I, um, I think this is a very exciting time for me. I can uh, remember that thrill of uh, first seeing patients improve on antipsychotics, then seeing people who didn't do well all of a sudden show a remarkable response to clozapine, kind of life-changing changes. Those were some of the great thrills of my professional life. And I'm uh, hoping that that's going to happen again with the uh, introduction of uh, drugs with uh, new mechanisms that are going to be uh, broadly effective, not uh, burdened by the horrible side effects that can occur with a D2 antagonists and, uh, and even with clozapine in many patients. Again, it's an exciting time. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I will stop sharing and uh, take questions. Well, thank you, Steve, for that impressive tour of um, where psychiatry has been and where we're headed. Uh, let me start off by asking, um, actually referring to what you mentioned before about how you know, most of us believe that medications that are highly effective potentially have high you know, uh, side effect burdens. And with some of these new medications, uh, you know, that might buck the trend. But specifically um, about clozapine, uh, so other than the, the side effect burden, I mean, is there a thought that because some of these medications operate through multiple receptors and mechanisms that, you know, some of it's driving efficacy and actually some of it may be working against you. And I think one yeah. thought is that, you know, clozapine has a high anticholinergic burden. Um, and isn't that having the opposite effect of the, the CARD XT as an agonist to M1 and M4? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. You know, the, one of the things that we haven't been able to figure out is why clozapine works so well. Uh, you know, and uh, it's interesting that, um, and of course, clozapine is so complex and it has different effects on different receptors. Actually, uh, a major metabolite of uh, clozapine, uh, n desmethylclozapine, uh, actually has a substantial amount of uh, M1 activity. And there have been studies that have suggested that when there's a higher ratio of the uh, desmethylclozapine metabolite to uh, just native clozapine, that uh, it has higher effects on cognition. So it could be that uh, actually it would initially seem to be a um, contradictory that uh, if you look more closely at clozapine's effect, it could actually have the kind of... Uh, uh, muscarinic effects, you know, similar to, to xenomaline, xenomaline, right? 
So to follow up on that, I know you've mentioned uh, there have been some studies on uh, one of the metabolites of, of clozapine as just a, an antipsychotic. Mm-hmm. But this, this metabolite is different from, from norclozapine? No, it, it is norclozapine. Oh, it is norclozapine, okay. No. I think you mentioned that the, those, those studies didn't bear out. Is that, is that correct for some reason? They, they didn't bear out as, as an antipsychotic. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it seems that, uh, that norclozapine does have cognitive enhancing effects uh, but doesn't really have uh, antipsychotic effects. We have a couple of questions actually regarding Cardex. Let me, let's just kind of continue on that vein. Mm-hmm. So uh, any thoughts, any discussion about its role for a bipolar disorder, uh, especially where cognition has been impacted post uh, mania? Well, you know, you know, you know, every antipsychotic that I'm aware of uh, has, been, has that's been tried in bipolar illness has had some efficacy. Uh, uh, so, um, whether or not uh, this mechanism, you know, this M1, M4 agonism uh, is effective, it, it'll be difficult. You know, it does, the thing about the, about the TAR1 is it's, they're so non-specific that uh, you just, it's almost like you're rolling the dice. The, what it's going to do. So it, well, that's that's what the tumor ones. For the uh, for the car XT for the muscarinic, I, I I'm sure they'll be tried. Uh, whether they'll have uh, antipsychotic effects, but also mood stabilizing effects, I I think will come from later trials. I I believe the company is at this stage. I'm not aware of their focusing at all on bipolar illness. And then another question regarding car XT. So you mentioned that the uh, GI side effects and nausea and vomiting seem to dissipate over time. That's, that's certainly encouraging. So ha- has there been any discussion about giving antiemetics during the initial period of, of car XT, maybe during the uptitration phase? Yeah, I, 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 you know, if this drug becomes widely available, I think we're all <laughs> going to have to become better at treating nausea. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, you know, you would uh, try to stay away from uh, drugs that treat nausea by uh, uh, D two mechanisms. Uh, and and again, the um, how to take adverse reactions in clinical trials? How do they translate to um, the actual? clinical populations, I think is going, is going to be very interesting. Uh, the company says that uh, people develop a tolerance uh, to these side effects and that, uh, and that they tend to stay in the trial. But, you know, I think most of us understand that feeling even slightly uh, nauseated really could decrease the quality of life. So, so we'll, we'll have to see how that works out. And then also a uh, question regarding card XT. Would you expect any TD risk uh, with long term use of that? Assuming that TD is related to changes in, in the dopamine receptor, I uh, don't believe that, uh, that there's likely to be a TD risk. Again, CAR XT shows almost no uh, EPS, and the strongest predictor of tardive dyskinesia is uh, EPS during acute treatment. So I think we predict that it probably won't cause a part of dyskinesia. And, and again, these drugs won't uh, cause, are unlikely to cause weight gain, which uh, you know, is another substantial um, problem with antipsychotics. A uh, question about uh, uh, Anya's work, Dr. Bashar's work on MDMA. I don't know if you know this, um, but do you know why they use methamphetamines as another comparison group? So it looks like they had placebo, a couple of doses of MDMA, and then uh, methamphetamine. Well, it'd be a good question to ask Anya, but uh, uh, the, the thing about uh, in, in these trials, uh, it, it's important to separate the social effects, which appear to be from MDMA, from the kind of stimulant effects that you would get from uh, methamphetamine or, or d So what, what that study did 
it's suggested, and, and, and again, MDMA is a form of amphetamine, mm -hmm. so which seems to have particular pro-social effects. So I think what that study was, was, was aimed at was kind of separating those two effects, but uh, it's a better question for Anya. Yeah, that's, that's my understanding, right? MDMA, you have serotonin and dopamine, and you just try to yeah. go off the dopamine, right? Yeah. A uh, question from Dr. Bifowitz. Um, so what is your approach to medication non-adherence of patients, especially when it, the, it doesn't have to do with side effects, but more about denial of illness or, or lack of awareness or insight about illness? Oh, you know, I, I, I wish I had a, an approach which I could say works. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's been the bane of existence for people who treat psychosis. Uh, I wish that the, there was a simple solution. You know, my, uh, the approach that I suggest taking is to have patients understand that they're not being forced to take these medications, uh, because suspiciousness is a part of the illness, but to to just suggest that uh, that they need to take control over their illness. They uh, take ownership of their illness. And the way to do that is to try things and to see if it works. If they don't feel pressured or obligated to take an antipsychotic, but they do it to, uh, as an effect of learning by themselves how these drugs make them feel in the long run, Sometimes that that's effective, but 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 I can't say that my record is great at convincing psychotic new people to take their antipsychotics. Um, so certainly part of the excitement about CAR XT and, and, and the Tarwin agonist is its novel mechanism of action and certainly the side effect burdens. Um, but in terms of uh, treating a or addressing a treatment resistant population. What are your thoughts about, you know, is, is this going to be like a clozapine where you're going to get folks who are not responding to, you know, two to three trials of your standard antipsychotics, but perhaps, you know, the mechanism of the illness is, is distinct. Any, any thoughts or predictions about that? Well, you know, uh, first of all, uh, much as I love clozapine, uh, it would be, uh, it seems like almost a dream that we could find a drug that's better tolerated than clozapine and, and works as well. Uh, you know, so I, uh, it's plausible that the, uh, that the potent effects of these antipsychotics will, uh, 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 you know, the, the M1, M4, and R1s, and there's likely to be other drugs with the same mechanisms uh, coming out in the future. The companies are, are looking at it, that if these mechanisms are more effective uh, than a clozapine and D2 antagonists, then it'll be important to get these drugs to patients early in the mm -hmm. Because, you know, what I've observed is that uh, changing people to clozapine can be life changing when it occurs early in the illness. Later in the illness, it it helps a lot, but uh, and that's always a problem because you know insurance companies make it very hard for people to access new drugs. But you wonder if these drugs, which don't have the long term side effects and the metabolic effect, uh, that um, maybe we could convince. You know, you know, you know, get them treated earlier in, in the course of, uh, you know, you know, the drug introduction, and then we have been with other new drugs. I, I may have missed this, but the the trials with CAR XT and the Tarwin Agnes were those done in a treatment resistant population? No, no, they they, they were done in uh, just acute schizophrenia. There have been no trials in treatment resistant patients, and um, you know what usually happens when a new drug comes out. It gets tried in people who are treatment resistant, and uh, uh, and that that way you could get those are some of the most difficult patients. But whether this will be effective for, for these drugs, I think will it, it may take years to know. So it remains an open question whether this can be uh, an alternative to um, clozapine for kind of that TRD population. Exactly. Yes. Okay. 
All right, well, we're at the top of the hour. Apologies to those who I didn't get the questions to. Perhaps Dr. Martin will take those questions uh, via email. Well, thank you everybody again for attending at a robust audience today. And thank you again, Steve, for a wonderful presentation and the Q&A. Thanks.